Some of you may be wondering what Black Sid or Black Sidus have to do with me as an African American living here in Taiwan, but not in Africa. I would also like to stress that even if you're not American or someone of African descent, you may find what I'm about to say to be of interest to you as well, because I will present elements that extends beyond the general topic. And if you're interested in finding out more, you'll just have to stay tuned. Welcome to Four Seas One Family. Welcome to Four Seas One Family, where we share thoughts and opinions concerning life in Taiwan, the region, and the world. I'm your host, James Thomas, coming to you from Taipei, Taiwan, and I'm so glad to have you traveling along with me on this journey. Welcome to the show. As an African American living abroad, I quickly found out that my U.S. passport wasn't a get-out-of-jail-free card or a document that guarantees me better treatment in other nations. I completely comprehend that my blue passport doesn't guarantee that I deserve or will have the same rights I have in America and other countries. And other Americans, especially those living overseas, must also understand this. Possessing a U.S. passport is undeniably a luxury because it allows the possessor to travel, often visa-free, to many nations. However, an African American with a U.S. passport and black pigmentation, in some places, this makes them more susceptible to suspicion and unequal treatment because not everyone who possesses a U.S. passport is conceptualized the same way by the government and people of other nations. And there are many reasons for this. The perceptions many people in other nations have of African Americans comes mainly from the news out of the United States, the entertainment and sports media, and sometimes comments from friends and family who reside in the United States. And unfortunately, to many African Americans, these sometimes colorful comments aren't flattering. If you are an African American or any person of color living abroad, you will undoubtedly and to some extent be racially profiled. Local community members may perceive people who look like you to be someone to be fearful of. Now, before you jump off the deep end, hold your breath. This may simply be because of the local residents' lack of interactions with people of darker complexions. It is also true in many cases that the negative representations of black people precedes them or the prejudices relayed back to them from friends and family abroad have been imprinted upon them. This is not to say that white people who have family lineage in Europe don't have similar representations preceding them abroad. On the other hand, an African American may find that this profiling may permit them to have access to some positive opportunities just because of their uniqueness, such as being invited to participate in public presentations, movies, photo opportunities, or even podcasts. Now, back to the topic of Blacksit, which I will make an attempt to explain why I'm looking into this as a movement. I'm doing so merely because most of the information available only talks about the campaign's positive aspects for people of African descent. However, I feel that some humanistic and political elements are being left out and shouldn't be avoided. Frankly, there are African Americans going to Africa who honestly do need to educate themselves regarding African nations' histories and cultures to prevent from being seen as someone who lacks respect for the local cultures of the continental population. Now, after speaking with a few continental Africans both here in Taiwan and Japan, and then compiling their observations— I've concluded that there are African Americans going to Africa with a mindset of having a sense of cultural superiority that may not appear to be apparent even to themselves. Blindly interacting in African nations isn't conducive for better cultural intermingling, especially between distant African relatives, because there is a very thin line that can sometimes be crossed when minuscule cultural differences become insurmountable obstacles that cause simple disagreements to become overblown, exacerbated pettiness. 
Most continental Africans can easily detect an African American's demeanor by speaking and interacting with them among the local continental population. When African Americans find themselves in occurrences that leave a negative impression of continental Africans upon them, they must remain aware that historical and cultural differences exist and handle these types of occurrences with respect. Because in reality, they may not be seen as distant relatives, but just simply outsiders. So it's a good idea for African Americans to be mindful of their actions and the words they choose during their interactions with their continental brothers and sisters. Today, Black Set is being promoted much like a call to action resulting from the heartbreaking conditions and history African American slaves went through. There are legitimate reasons why AAs feel it's better to return to their ancestors' lands. And you don't have to be of African descent to understand this. In my previous episode, I mentioned how African Americans who have decided to relocate themselves to their ancestors' lands could quickly become the victims of nefarious figures or swindlers. To begin with, as a foreign national, in some cases, you may automatically be limited to or restricted from, without even explanation, from taking part in certain public activities or access to public locations. And these limits and restrictions could be rooted in cultural and religious differences or simply differences in political ideologies. When disputes between African Americans and continental Africans occur, African Americans look for ways to solve grievances through American embassies in Africa. However, American embassies may not be willing or unable to resolve certain particular issues between African Americans and continental Africans. The possible reasons for this go way beyond what I want to discuss in this particular episode. From my observations and after speaking with a few African Americans living in Africa, it is advisable that anyone, and especially African Americans in particular, travel to Africa with the means to support themselves long term while settling. In other words, make sure that you have enough of a financial cash flow to stay independent. And by doing so, you would remain independent and less of a target for people who have nefarious motives. The next thing anyone would need to do before they go to Africa or any continent is to make sure that they have the skills necessary to find a job and support themselves so that they won't become an eyesore or burden to the local population. No one should go to any country or continent with an attitude that they will be able to just walk in and do whatever they want, because if they do so, they'll be setting themselves up for an unpleasant surprise. So if you're an African American or anyone from any nation, ask yourself, what acquired skills do you have that would make you more valuable to the people of Africa? and how you can use your skills to assist people in Africa to achieve their goals, which will allow you to achieve your goals as well. Keep in mind that these goals may not only be based on financial endeavors, but on spiritual or personal growth. If you want to build better relationships with people in Africa or any other nation, the key is not to travel there with a savior complex. Now, once again, For African Americans who are looking to go to Africa to restart their lives, the best way for anyone to rekindle their life is to build up enough personal resources that would make them a person of value to themselves and other people as well. Focus on educating yourself and have enough savings that would allow you to stay motivated and caffeinated until you are ready to undertake the actions that would secure you a comfortable future. Many people from other nations have done exactly this in Africa. For example, look at how the Chinese are moving into Africa at an exponential rate. They took their time to gather the required knowledge and finances that allowed them to become a robust and influential force in Africa. And to an extent, continental Africans have become dumbified on how the Chinese diaspora in Africa was able to build such a command and lead over them in their own nation. African Americans have also been wondering how Chinese-run businesses were able to build such a large footprint in many of their low-income urban communities. And the answer is quite simple. 
Many Chinese were able to strategically use their acquired knowledge to multiply financial resources gathered from friends and family in China, some with substantial connections in China, which allowed them to create a niche that eclipsed local-run businesses. Their diligence and patience helped them become independent and financially sustainable. And this doesn't include Chinese state-owned enterprises. And this warrants a, just a separate discussion on this topic. In my opinion, this is what African Americans who are planning to or who have already moved to Africa should be doing. African Americans should be willing to invest the time to educate themselves on the way things are done in Africa and learn the best way to communicate with their ethnologically related relatives in Africa. African Americans must be constantly aware that black people in Africa may have apprehensions when dealing with their culturally related brothers and sisters from America. And you can't blame them. As an African American, I am aware of how some African Americans become apprehensive when they are dealing in business with other African Americans. And this behavior may simply be part of the nature of how business is done anywhere in any nation. African Americans also come from an environment where pettiness can easily cause unneeded viral rivalry. It is best to avoid this type of temperament and negativity at all costs. Most of what I'm observing from African Americans planning to or who are already in Africa are their entrepreneurial plans to become financially successful for themselves. I haven't come across any African American in or going to Africa with the sole purpose of making Africa stronger for the continental Africans. And I've spoken to continental Africans who feel that this is the only reason why African Americans want to go to Africa. Now, is this selfish? You know, please leave a comment below if you would like to share your thoughts on this opinion. So if you are an African-American thinking about going to or who is already in Africa, make it your goal to use your skills to uplift Africa and its people and not only yourself. African-Americans need to look at how model immigrant communities in America supported themselves and built respectable businesses. If African-Americans are unwilling to do so, People from other diasporas, especially from China, will be more than happy to occupy the positions they weren't diligently working hard to nurture. China and other nations see Africa as an essential consumer base to expand their markets and export resources. In China's case, and in many other nations' cases, Africa is seen as an essential source of valuable materials like gold, copper, silver, and rare metals to export to their industry and aid their population. From my perspective, African Americans should be aiding continental Africans in controlling their natural resources. This action must be taken to prevent African nations from having their valuable resources controlled by outside influences like China and to some extent India or any other country that isn't too concerned with preserving the vast resources and cultures of Africa. Those African Americans who are already in or who are planning to go to Africa should be focused more on helping African nations build a strong financial, governmental, and military proudness. This goal would allow African nations to remain fully independent and at the same time protect themselves from external aggressions. The truth is powerful nations have used their capital and military strength to keep less financially and military affluent nations poor or needy. Many powerful nations have used their influence in Africa to corrupt local officials and persuade them to be allowed to acquire resources needed to advance their government and nation and not Africa or any other continent or country. So when we hear rhetoric of one nation investing in a struggling nation, country, or continent to advance their infrastructure, take a moment to think why they are investing so much time and capital to do so. Powerful nations desperately need countries in Africa to acquire resources from 
to maintain or advance their development and, in some cases, their dominance. And if you don't believe me, take a closer look at the histories of nations on the continent of Africa. Many nations in Africa have become too reliant on their Chinese diasporas, and this is clearly a danger. African nations' reliance on their Chinese diasporas has indirectly caused many local African governments to become infectiously corrupt and uncontrollable, and in many cases controlled by Chinese-controlled directives. The African-American diaspora in Africa must work together to build a stronger Africa. This would allow continental Africans to remain independent, improve governmental reforms, control natural resources, and ultimately their destiny. Don't allow Africa to become lost because of outside influences that don't see Africa and its people as a force to be respected. If you found what we have to offer of value, please click on the subscribe and bell buttons below to keep up to date with our current episodes. And if you're listening to our podcast, please subscribe and help us spread the word that we have a lot more in common than we think. We're very interested to hear what you have to say. Before Seas One Family, I'm James Thomas in Taipei, Taiwan, and remember to take care wherever you are in the world.